All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here today uh, and, and give you a talk uh, about design, which is uh, just an amazing thing uh, to, to talk about. Um, my name is Nathan Strew. Uh, I lead product UX uh, for the Google Play product. And joining me on stage is Tadeo Zucchini and Will Kiefer, both colleagues of mine uh, who both work on Play. So here we are, lovely photos. Uh, so pretty much everyone in the room should be familiar with uh, the Google Play product. Uh, and if you're not, uh, we are not just a store. Uh, we are responsible for all of the other media applications that make up the Play family. Uh, and we're not just on the Android platform. Uh, we also work on iOS and on the web as well. And so by th at this stage in your I.O. experience, you should be very, very familiar with material design at this point, or at least somewhat familiar, uh, from the keynote and other sessions. So we're here today to talk about uh, how, as an apps team, we have been approaching the material design uh, within play, and hopefully get you guys on a path to purposeful and considered design improvements. And we're not here today to reveal the new Play products or features or to announce a ship date. But what we want to do is to give you a peek behind the curtain about how our team is thinking about the same challenges and opportunities you encounter as you are addressing a robust platform update, such as L. And so all of the mocks and motion studies we're going to show you today are just iterative. They don't represent the final product, and we'll we're continuing to work hard over the coming months uh, to bring this vision for life, to life, for you. And so you're familiar with the driving principles of the new design language, such as material is the metaphor. We're relying on bold, graphical, and intentional uh, graphics, and that our motion is providing meaning. And so we, when we started working with material design, we were incredibly excited about the opportunity that was ahead of us. Uh, and so today, I want to run through some of these things we were super excited about. So again, material design's motion story is meaningful and appropriate. It's serving to focus attention and maintain continuity throughout your user experience. The feedback is subtle and clear, and transitions are meaningful. Material design all, also relies on the fundamental print design tools that you may have heard of earlier, such as baseline grids and structural templates that can scale across various page types. The improved structural guidance is super important for the Play product because since we're a suite of products, uh, it's, it's incredibly important for us to maintain visual consistency among them. Some of the other things we're, we're looking at and super excited about was, was the bold and colorful language. It can not only help tell your brand story, but can also provide more engagement and enrichment within your UIs. And as the designers in the room should know, too many type sizes and styles can totally wreck a layout. It can confuse the visual hierarchy and dramatically affect the user experience. So Material Design's typography set offers a variety of type sizes that can work seamlessly with the layout grids that we described before. In a material design, imagery, whether it's illustration or photography, not only provides visual interest to the page, but it can provide the user with context. In play, we think of images as the heroes of our UI, as it puts the emphasis on the content you guys love, like your favorite music albums, your favorite movies, your favorite books. And combined together, the material guidelines make it easier than ever to scale your products to multiple platforms. And part of what really excited us was that we felt like we were already doing a lot of these things right. And my point is that a lot of you guys in the room are also doing these things right. Like we see apps every single day uh, on the Android ecosystem that are just getting better and better and follow a lot of these same principles. The thing was that material design has given us a much bigger sandbox to play in, and it's making it a lot easier for us to do the types of experiences that we want to do. And so I'm going to take a step back a little bit. And so I joined the Play team about two years ago, and at that point, the product was in a much different 
place, uh, as you can see by these images. We were doing a lot of things well, but we had a lot of work to do. And so as we worked together with our product and engineering partners, we really wanted to set out very specific product goals and redefine how we're positioning play. Things like telling a cohesive brand story among all the different content types. We wanted to create a consistent and responsive UX framework that can scale. We wanted to build shared engineering components, and we wanted to make sure we were working with a top-down product vision that everyone could align to. Maybe most importantly, the design team really wanted to focus on building relationships with partners outside of design. Uh, our engineering partners, our product partners, our marketing partners, with very early involvement in an iterative design approach. And so we set out to define a visual and interaction framework that can scale responsibly to multiple device types and orientations. We wanted to be very expressive with our color to give each product in the family its own personality while not overwhelming the content. And also because Play is a media product, we wanted to make sure that our content was front and center. We wanted to represent it as best as we could. And so as we were thinking about our current design in the material world, the challenge seemed daunting at first. You know, you have a new platform update, things can be a little scary, what am I gonna do? Do we redesign from the ground up? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably in the same boat. And so, you know, you've recently updated your products, how should you go about a, a addressing this issue? And we, we chose to see it rather as a challenge, as an opportunity. So we wanted to take a step back and address and identify some of these core opportunities in our UI. And so we started with our current product. We wanted to identify our hero screens and review them together as a team. And so our hero screens were the key screens that represented a subset of the pages within the entire UI. Uh, things like our product detail pages, our library views, our landing pages. And we wanted to identify the common UI, UI elements and patterns that existed across these pages uh, and take note of them, look at where we could make improvements. And because design doesn't happen in a vacuum, uh, and great product doesn't get created without advocacy of folks outside of design, things like quality and craftsmanship and attention to detail, it's very important for groups outside of design to, to understand these things and to embrace them. And so we really wanted to workshop together with these partners, inviting them in, doing a series of different workshops, getting their, getting their feedback and involvement as early and often as possible so that we could all be thinking ahead and understand the vision that we're sharing together. And so workshopping helps get everybody on the same page uh, and, and gets a lot of high-level thinking there. But our next step was to really get a little more tactical about it, meaning like our team likes to use sprint methods where we take very specific design challenges and go heads down across di disciplines working on very similar design problems. Uh, again, sharing that work often. And this can be a day-long exercise, this can be a week-long exercise. It just depends on the complexity of the problem. And so quickly recap here, I just wanna underscore the fact that it's really important to approach material design and thinking about the opportunities within your product. It's, it's not just about design, but it's about how you work together with your teams to bring that institutional advocacy and importance to these sometimes subtle things, you know, the craftsmanship. It's, it's thoughtful design is just not about being a differentiator anymore. It's, it's pretty much table stakes at, at this point. So earlier today in this room, uh, a, a good friend of mine, Marco, and Kirill talked about how we approached the responsive design problem in play. And we spent a lot of time in our current UI thinking about our structure. And so with material design, we didn't want to throw away that really good thinking that we had, we had invested lots of time in. We wanted to leverage our existing structure, but be a little more deliberate so we could take advantages of the opportunities that we had in, in, in connecting the structure in more logical ways. So again, the reason why I'm underscoring this point is that many of you uh, may have a product, uh, you may have a general structure or an architecture that you feel pretty happy with. And uh, you, like us, we, we didn't feel like we needed to re reinvent the wheel on everything. We wanted to be very tactical. For instance, one of the structural opportunities we wanted to look at was our card system. Uh, if you're familiar with the Play product, we ob obviously leverage, like Google does, uh, the card metaphor to represent content. Uh, 
so the material framework was giving us an opportunity to do really great things, like the dynamic shadowing and the, the transformation from scene to scene. Uh, and so we really wanted to use this as an example of, of one structural component that we saw as a very opportunistic way to bring a lot of value to the product. And so keep in mind, just like design is in a vacuum, we weren't thinking of structure uh, in isolation. We try to avoid the waterfall process where you, know, you identify things, it goes to visual design, then to interaction design, maybe motion. At some point, it ends up in the hands of engineers. Uh, but the, the point is we want to advocate a parallel process where you know, this is obviously dependent on the size of your team, uh, but we, we wanted to advocate a process where we're working together and in parallel. Uh, to iterate on these ideas because we draw a lot of inspiration from one another. Visual layout can, can greatly affect uh, interaction design and visual design can do storyboarding to influence motion design and we can all riff off of one another. And so to, I'm going to bring Teddy to the stage where we're going to talk a little bit about how this work we did in the beginning will set up some of the design work. Uh, Teddy will show you. Thank you, Nate. Hello, everyone. So now that we have a solid structure in place, let's, let's see how we uh, work and how we bring together and visualize in Google Play in material design. So first we went crazy. And you know, structure and guidelines are really uh, important, but uh, to evolve our vision language, we want to have uh, inspiration. It requires inspiration. So we went pretty crazy and created tons of visual design without too much consideration of the material design guidelines at this point. So we're exploring from iconography to typography, uh, images, and, and motion as well. Some, there was some good stuff, some maybe too out of scope, but as you can imagine, we have a lot of reviews, and with the goal of narrowing all this uh, tremendous amount of creative work with material design. And at the same time, we, need, we set the, another goal that was to create a visual system that can give our play product a unique voice and respect the individual needs of the play family. So how did we align the visual exploration with material design and at the same time keep the identity and the personality of Google Play? The, the team look at... Okay. The, the team look at the material design guidelines and trying to understand what was already successful in, in our uh, product and also the nature of the product, which is a very content-rich and media-focused product. So we determined which aspect of the visual design language were, were more important. And we start with typography, which can have a huge impact in your app, such as uh, interaction or hierarchy or legibility and also branding. So with material design, one of the benefits is that we have a uh, pretty large and flexible font family. And we want to extend that our typography uses in the, in the product and make it more purposeful and more compelling. So we apply more style, like the serif or the theme or the medium for action and, uh, and so on, and make it more appropriate. And we wanted to give the page a more breathing room, <laughs> feel less cluttered and complicated. And so we had a generous amount of padding, and we play with alignment as well. So this will give the UI a more fresh and modern and clean, and, and the text will be more easy, easier to read. So we also increase the contrast and adjusting the scale of the typography to make the hierarchy more cleaner and, 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 and easy to, to read. And we explore also overlaying typography and content, which could be really powerful, and considering things like legibility of the text without compromising the image and the message. And then colors. Colors can be really powerful in UI design. And with material design, we embrace it completely. Um, so we take advantage of this beautiful new material design uh, color palette, which represent the Google brand colors. And we wanted to apply it to our UI. So what we, what we have done, we wanted to make the colors more vivid and exciting. And so we started redefining all the usage of our color in the whole play experience. And we made, we made the color brighter and more vibrant to represent more the, the, the Google Play brand and also have a more fresh and modern look. And there is also a um, functional aspect of, the, of using color, like you have a sense of place, you know where you are, or action are more highlight and more easy to read. 
We also play with color extraction, which is really important part of the material design guidelines. And you, you can see how it works well in a, in a service like Play, which is a media service. So this is a great example to show you how material design guidelines can be flexible enough to make your own color palette. In fact, we extract the color that we needed and we make our own color palette. Imagery. When you think about play, you think about content, media, it's defined by its own content, which of course uh, rely heavily on images. So we always wanted to be bold, and we were already pretty bold right now with the product, but we want to be even more immersive and represent the content in all this beauty. And most importantly, we want to create an emotional connection between the user and the content. So we started developing for different screen size, and well, you can imagine how big and bold can be the images in a, in a larger screen, such as a TV or a, or a tablet. So the content speaks for itself, and the content is the real hero of the page. So of course we align other things uh, to material design, like the grid, and the layout, the metric, and of course iconography as well. So you can see that everything has a consistent visual story, the play, the play experience feel like part of the same family, and this could be a possible evolution of our visual language with material design applied. So these were the three areas of our visual language that we did our first pass. And for other products, such as a text editor app or a messaging app or your product, your starting point can be totally different. But there is something more important that is missing here that combine all these things together and with interaction and actually make a truly enchanting and magic experience, which is motion. One of the core aspects of material design, as you already probably know, is motion is how, how can motion design can bring life into a product. And we were really excited about that. So the team, the visual designer, were already exploring all this stuff before in, in, in our early exploration. So we were doing also visual exploration and storyboard that can represent motion and can be easily translated into moving images. So we start thinking about how, fun, how we can find a way to tie all these things together and, and thinking about how the way users uh, move through the experience, how interact with, and engage with the content and the emotion that you feel during all of this. So but we can apply motion without a story. And what is our motion story? It's pretty straightforward. It's like a typical story. Like there is a starting point where in a motion world it can be translated like um, the user is guided into the, to the UI and how things appear, how things load. And then there is a, a, a middle state where the action happens and what's, what's the, the feeling and the emotion that the user is, is feeling at that moment. And then there is the end where the animation is actually resolving, so where user land in, into the page after the animation. So as Nate were mentioned before, we define hero screen, but also we define hero moments that will guide all this exploration that you're gonna see today. And things like how the object moves in the space, how the object appears or uh, transition, and most importantly, create meaningful motion that can connect emotionally and can make you feel something. So taking on the later structure that Nate was talking about before, you can already see that once it's in motion, you understand where the objects are and, and how they could move and potentially how you can interact with them. And the parallax effect is not just a flavor or just a fashion thing that everyone is using right now, but it's actually pur purposeful for the, for the motion. You understand where the objects are and, and how you can interact with them. Um, blocking out the animation. Once we were starting doing this prototype and, and exploration, it was really important to get the animation right. So we reduced completely the level of detail and thinking blocks and focus, focus only on the motion and the actual essence of the motion and bring the movement as natural as possible. So don't worry about rounded corner or pixel perfect stuff in this time. Um, so this is our early exploration where we wanted to show uh, how things load in the page, and, but we weren't quite happy with that because there is too much going on. There is too much uh, tilting the car too fast, and it was an, it was an overwhelming experience. Users were actually too distracted from the movement. So we simplified the transition 
and make it more simple and guide the user attention and focus to the actual important thing, which is the, the content. So we explore also how content loads when there is a major change in the screen layout. Like in this case, you, you tap to a collection, you go into the detail phase. And what is very inter interesting here is with, with material design, you have, you have a feeling that you have full control of the UI, and that you actually almost paint the screen with your finger. And here another example of how things can, um, can load from a place into a totally different uh, place. Like here, I'm in a, in a home home page and then I'm going to a detail page. And here example of how you could interact with objects, like opening and closing. And in this case, in newsstand, you're opening the object and the card expands and it goes edge to edge until it, it got full screen and, and you see the, the, the real content in all this beauty. So this transition is also especially important because you have a special sense of where things are and moves. And in this case, the most important thing is the backward transition, which if you have to tell the story, you have to tell a complete story. So you, just, you want also to be a more smooth and, and, and clear experience once you're going back. So backward transition for us was crucial as any other key motion. Of course, we were doing all of this motion study with engineering and iterating and reviewing, and, but we will go in depth about that. Um, again, uh, opening and closing element is fast, is in place. The card expands and contracts. The object is smart, it knows where it comes from and it knows where it lands. And of course, detail matters. So we look at purposeful animation and, and enhance the overall experience with little touches, like in this case, the loading spinner. You also have a chance to brand these things, so we were trying to ex express the, the product that we were um, showing, in this case, movies. So this will give the, the user an engagement and also a, a little bit of surprise and curiosity to the UI. Again, details are important, so an animation that could be static and and pretty boring, we actually try to make uh, a storytelling aspect into it, so like the downloading arrow. So here there is, this is an example of how can be the, the potential complete story once you combine all these pieces together. So these are our hero moments. Every app has their own one, so it, it's up to you to define which one. So this is just part of the magic. This is mean nothing without the actual someone that can make it real. And as Nate was mentioning before, it, it was the effort of the team working together with engineering, product, researcher. And, and in this time, we'll have Will talking about uh, in detail how we actually did these things. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a little glimpse into uh, the engineering process and what was going on throughout all this on the engineering side of things. And the key takeaway is really that it was the same. Um, we were working in parallel and collaborating sort of simultaneously um, back and forth. And one of the early things Nate mentioned is um, the early stage of identifying your opportunities, right? I'm really lucky because I actually work on both UX frameworks and on the Play Suite of apps, and so um, I kind of get to wear both hats, and there are opportunities in both of these places, right? So the core tenet from the framework side of things, uh, the core opportunity there was to make it really easy for your apps. Um, we basically wanted to bake the material DNA into the framework so that uh, that stuff just comes along with your apps and, and, and life is easy and you can focus on making the subtle, um, the subtlety that is appropriate for your app, right? So things like cards are first class citizens now, right? So you have consistency across your cards in your app, across the system, the notification, the system UI, and it feels like part of one family, right? And there's elevation and layering um, to, for your you know, hero images or your hero content. And then shadows for maybe you have custom shadows for content that doesn't quite fit in, in what the framework provides. That's all, that's all there. Uh, complex layouts are now much easier. Everyone knows that um, design and engineering knows that like ListU is very arduous to do some complex things. So now you have actual proper support both in L and in the Compat library with RecyclerView to um, 
make layouts that are appropriate for your content and actual support for animating things in and animating things out. Um, so it's, it's really nice. And actually, my personal favorite is the suite of APIs around um, scene transitions, right? This opens up a whole new category of um, story and design for your app that just basically wasn't possible before, right? And scene transitions are how your, uh, your app or your activity animates in and then animates out when it's disappearing. And this is into your app or across activities in your app or even between applications. It's, it's really pretty powerful. If you want to dig into some of the things, um, some of this a little deeper. Uh, yesterday's What's New in Android talk is on video is a great whirlwind tour of everything. Um, and then actually right now there's a talk on material science uh, where they dig in. You can catch that on video. And I think at 2 p.m. there's another talk um, where they're going to walk through actually building um, material witness, building an actual Android app with all this stuff. So that's a little bit of the opportunities on the framework side. And, right, and so apps have the, their own sort of personal opportunities. Nate mentioned what what Play was looking at early on. Your apps may have different things, but the other opportunities to leverage the framework. So next up was structure. Um, and uh, this is actually really interesting because one of my other favorite parts about the material design language is it's very, it has very strong guidelines, it's very opinionated, um, and has a strong philosophy, right? But it's not actually very rigid in your app structure. There's actually a lot of flexibility in the system to make an app that fits your content, fits your structure, fits what you want to do. Um, and so earlier, Teddy um, alluded to like the structure that Play was developing. And this didn't just sort of uh, come overnight and get thrown over the wall from design to engineering, right? This is, uh, this is a really good example where we were working together um, and parallel and collaborating here. So I'm going to share a little vignette of like an actual true story. Um, of Play Newsstand and, and how that was happening. So early on, I saw some amazing uh, blue sky sort of moments, visual, um, visual mocks and motion design and stuff. So I just went and started prototyping. And so everything you see here is actual random prototypes from, the, from this time off my laptop. Um, and I worked at it. I did a whole bunch of iterations. I made builds. And I just like was not happy, right? There were a couple issues that, that that came up when actually implementing it that were really, I felt like we were going to have to like start over or take a new direction, right? There was issues with um, tabs and, and having layers actually split when we scrolled and, and trying to blend these, these different layers and parallax. And it's, it's sort of, they're subtle issues, but they were there. Um, and so basically, I uh, was giving daily builds, and one day I thought, oh man, okay, we're going to have to start over. So I turned it off. I reverted it, and the next daily build like, went back to sort of a previous iteration. Um, and a designer, the legendary Marco, came up to me like that day and was like, hey, where did that go? This was awesome. I loved it. And I said, oh, well, obviously it can't work because of you know, engineering reason A, B, C. And, he's like, and he said, no, 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 this is, this, we can do this. Um, let's iterate. Let's solve those little those problems, right? And so we ended up coming to a place, this is sort of the next stage, where we're like, oh yeah, it's actually working. This is, the, I think we can pursue the structure. Um, and this would not have happened had we not actually been prototyping and, and iterating together, right? Having people live with prototypes, even if they're very rough and um, not quite right, really lets you know if the structure is gonna, gonna work, because you're living with it. You can see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and so this was like the next stage. We were getting a little bit closer and feeling like, yes, we could pursue the structure. And once we got there, then the whole sort of rest of the pieces of the app started to fall into place uh, and become like a cohesive story around this. Right, so that's a little glimpse at the structure, right? P iterating in conjunction with each other, living with it, and solving those like solving the structure early on with prototypes to, to basically prove out the technical feasibility of is that going to work, right? And you'll notice I showed some iOS uh, footage there. And Play is, is a cross-platform product, right? So this was going on. We were firing on all cylinders, web, iOS, and Android. Um, because the challenges on each platform are going to be a little bit different, and the interaction models can be a little bit different. And so it's really important that if you're doing cross-product work that um, that you're kind of repeating this process in parallel across the different platforms. So the final piece is story. Um, and Teddy talked about this a little bit. And so what is story? It's basically connecting these hero moments that you've defined for your app using motion design and using animation. And this animation is not actually 
fluff. It's not eye candy, right? They're, it's very purposeful. So when a user touches on you know, a card with an image and a title, and that image and title stays on screen, transitions into place, um, and supporting content and details appear to basically supplement it, there are fewer pixels moving on the screen. And with fewer pixels moving, there's actually less cognitive overhead for, the, for your user. Right? Um, if, if it's an abrupt transition and everything changes at once, uh, there's actually a lot more cognitive overhead. The user has to sort of like rescan everything and reacquaint themselves with where everything went. So this is very, very purposeful, right? Um, and that doesn't mean everything has to be completely smooth, like everywhere, right? There, there can be abrupt changes, just like in, in novels and film and music. There can be a, abrupt changes, uh, but they're purposeful. They're, on, they're there to, for a reason. And so we looked at Newsstand and we said, okay, what's one of our really common transitions that now we can like, leverage this opportunity, right? And so collections of cards of articles to the actual article themselves. And you saw some of the motion studies on this earlier, right? This was a great opportunity for us. And how did engineering actually tackle this at the same time that the motion designers were working on it? And we used the same techniques. We used blocking, right? Here's a, a random early prototype of just getting the blocks in place and giving the designers knobs to tweak like live on the device to adjust timings and curves and all sorts of stuff um, so that they get really immediate feedback to feel what's working. Because when it's in your hand, it just changes everything, right? Um, here's another example in Tablet, right, where uh, I slowed the entire animation down. I used a big bright red debug color just so I could really focus on what was going on. And here, it turned out that this was not right, right? You'll see the right edge hits the right edge of the tablet before the left side does. And it wasn't quite right. It wasn't working. So we, we iterated and we adjusted. And you wouldn't really notice that if you just put in the final sort of transition without the color and stuff. Um, because it might just look pretty good and all right, but really slowing it down, getting those details right. And so blocking is actually very helpful on an engineering perspective. And so when you start putting all these things together, you get this, um, you get this motion story without these rough edges. And everything you do and touch with the screen is, is purposeful and interactive. Um, and it's important here that these early prototypes, the level of detail is high, right? This is not perfect. There's a lot of bugs. There's a lot of weird, you know, color and issues. But the important part is that the, at a granular level, it, it's where you're going. And you live with it, and you see if it's working. So that's a little bit about story. And finally, I just wanted to basically highlight two sort of key takeaways from our talk today. And one is this idea that Nate mentioned of institutional advocacy for design, right? If everybody is involved in design, then everybody feels a bit of ownership over that design. And if everyone feels ownership of that design, then everyone is invested in it and you get much better results, right? Uh, we have engineering, product, and design all working together. Um, and this scales. This scales from a one-person indie dev to a big company, right? Um, design advocacy applies in both situations, and arguably, it's even more important when your team is much bigger, right? Because it's easier to sort of start throwing things over the wall and, and, and you don't get quite as good results that way. And the last point is leveraging your opportunity. Uh, this is basically finding those hero moments, finding the, the parts of your app you want to improve, the parts of your app you want to highlight, and building around those first. Build like blue skies, building really nice mocks, and working out from there, right? Using those to define your structure or refine your structure if you already feel very happy with what you have. And then um, prototyping early, building that stuff, living with it to see if it's working, right? And then connecting those dots using the motion study and the story that you want for the app. And this is just really fantastic because material design gives you these tools to basically connect all this together um, and improve how everything works. So thank you for coming out and letting us give you a little sneak peek into what Play is doing. Um, and we've got a little bit of time for questions, I think. It's about 10 minutes. So um, I'll hand the mic to Nate, and then you can answer. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, there's mics uh, on both sides of the room, if anyone has anything. And if not, you can always find us afterwards, too. No? Crickets. Crickets. You guys 
Is this on? Can you guys talk a little bit about your uh, your process and the tools that you use? Um, you know, who on the team is the creative lead? You know, who comes up with that concept uh, before you invest a bunch of time prototyping? You know, you probably should put that into some sort of a software that's easier than you know a software that you're writing code. Um, sure. So, what are sure. those tips? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a little variable for for everyone depending on the size of the team def, depending on what tools you're comfortable with. Uh, we have the benefit of of working with uh, a, a good sized team where we have people with some After Effects skills who are doing uh, you know quick prototyping, motion studies, leveraging some of the visual mocks and assets that have already been created. Um, but it, it can be it can be whatever works for you. If whatever works quickly and fast uh, to to get you to a point where you can you can really start feeling how something is working in your hand. Uh, I think it's variable. For us, it's a combination of some internal tools that we've developed uh, in addition to, to things like After Effects, uh, but, but it, it, it's hugely variable. But even like the, the, the process that we are actually doing, we are starting maybe from a story, uh, you know, for sketches, and then we go into uh, static mocks with Illustrator, and then uh, we pass it through the prototyper, and he, is, you know, we After Effects in five seconds, it does everything. So that's... It could be that or it could be just directly on After Effects. So it's variable. It depends on the interaction that we want to, and the motion that we want to do. And we also, and even just really simple like HTML prototypes too. Yep. We definitely right. take advantage of those just to get something quick and, you know, on a browser on the device. Hi. Uh, what do you find are the best methods and practices for getting good design advocacy, especially across uh, large platforms? Uh, since Play covers so many domains, I figured this might be something that you could offer some insight into. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely. something that my company's just now getting really big about, so uh, it's got some bumps and bruises. I, any advice would be awesome. <laughs> sure. I mean, it. Um, it, it, it it, it's, a, it's a tough thing to tackle, right? Um, Google historically has, has, has been an engineering-driven company, and design over the last uh, two to three years has, has really become a top-down, from, from Larry down, something that uh, is incredibly important. So I think the sooner you can engage uh, folks who are, who are driving, uh, the better. And it, and it never hurts to, to give, show people examples. Like, this is, the, this is other products in the wild. They don't even necessarily have to be competitive products. They're just being able to show people like the state of the art, like what people are doing, uh, is hugely important because not everybody knows, right? Like if you're not in a design world or you're not in an, in an engineering world, it, I think it's really important to let people know like what is going on in the wild and how these innovations are happening quickly and the and the quality bar is raising all the time. So it has to be considered. And then on the flip side, I'd also say there's, a, there's like a grassroots approach too if your leadership is not necessarily like happy about doing that, is that designers and engineers can just work together. Like, like literally that moment of just collaborating and just brainstorming, like involving each other in that part is really nice because then you're on board together. Um, that was really good in the early days of Newsstand, right? We got a couple engineers and a couple designers in a room with basically where do we want to be in 10 years and where do we want to be in five years and just worked it out and then you're you feel like you're on the same team so then and you're you both have ownership over it so it's easier to drive that just from the bottom layer too hi oh yeah Hi, I'm Prashant. I run a small uh, app company. Uh, one point of contention we have is basically when to do the handover from engineering to design, essentially. So my designer come up with, we think of feature, my designer come up with a beautiful UI layout and workflow. And the engineer, first thing they say is that this is not a standard UI component. Like you should think in terms of standard UI components available and all. So when standardization, a, do you encourage using only the standard UI component because users are familiar and they they less learning curve? And when to empower like designer? And when how do you make the decision? Sure, no, that's a that's a very good question, and I think super relevant. Um, 
I think there's a lot of factors that, that go into, into that handoff. Um, I mean, I, I think it depends on, uh, you know, the, the competency of your, your designers and how familiar they are with working with framework components. And, and as Will is talking about, it's that collaboration, right? So if, if there are designers that aren't, uh, fully aware of, of what the suite of uh, a framework can offer, uh, it, it's really good to, to try to bring them up to speed. And also going back to like wh how we were discussing opportunity, it's like where do you get the most value, like the most bang for your buck in going a custom route, right? Now for like certain experiences, uh, taking what the framework offers you with minor changes, things that are, that are easy to do in code, that can make a big difference in design, like changing font scaling or changing color palettes, changing background assets. Like these things are relatively cheap ways that still leverage the framework, but can, can give you a very different look and feel. Uh, but it's also about like, when is it appropriate to override the framework or do something custom? Uh, and, and it's, it's, I think that decision comes from, from working together as a team and determining whether or not it's worth the engineering investment. Like, is the payoff going to be big enough on, on doing a component custom? Like, maybe for, like, as an example in play, like, maybe we don't want to take, uh, you know, the, the, the platform scrubber bar because we want to bring something more branded or, or something that's differentiated. And for us, maybe that's a big win. I'm not saying that's what we're doing, but that, that could be an example of, of, of how you address that. And from the engineering perspective, I'd say um, what's great about material design is it's sort of like a higher level philosophy that's not like use this button, use this thing, right? It's like here are the guidelines and here are the red lines and these things. And so actually the, the compat library and the framework are in some ways much more flexible to achieve what previously might have been a lot more of a custom component. Um, so between prototyping with like After Effects or something more interactive like Quartz or HTML, uh, when do you see that payoff in, in going interactive and what goes into that decision making? Is it just the skill sets on the team or is, it, or is there some sort of uh, thought process? Uh, great question. Um, we, we, we would advocate for, for getting it in people's hands as quickly as possible. I mean, even literally if it's sketches on paper that are, that are captured and, and broken up into like the variety of tools that are available for doing quick, iterative, rapid prototyping on device. Uh, we, we live in a world where, where everything is interactive and, and statics can't capture how something is going to feel. Uh, and, and so we in general advocate for trying to do that as quickly as possible with any, with any tool that, that works. Uh, and you can continue to refine and iterate and develop and polish as you're going. And that tool set can, can adapt depending on what your needs are. But the, I, the sooner you can start playing with something, the better. Yeah, it's, it's a parallel track. I mean, you know, maybe the motion designer will start designing the, the, the motion and then the, the, the first draft we can we get you know in the prototype and then we figure out what we, what we could do and the production design will go ahead and do all the pixel perfectly meanwhile the engineer will fix the motion i mean it's a it's a collaboration and and i've been known to put just static images and movies and view them in gallery on the phone <laughs> just cuz holding it in your hand kind of changes it and so you can really get an easy fake interactive thing by pressing play and just kind of Hi, uh, I had a question about creating cross-platform mobile apps. Um, like, let's say you're working on Android uh, with the new material design and you're also working on iOS. Um, both sort of have similar design paradigms whenever you sort of look at depth. You know, iOS accomplishes that with blur, whereas material design does it with subtle shadows. So my question is, whenever you're creating an app for both platforms, do you conform to the design paradigms of the specific platform, or should you try to just create one single, like, uh, cohesive design across both versions of your app? That's sure, good. that's a that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a direct answer. There's there's certain platform paradigms that are very core to a user experience. Um, there are some that that. You can, you can kind of, you, 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 for instance, a good example is, is, you know, when we were developing music on iOS, 
we wanted, we really felt our interaction of our tab model uh, was super successful, and, and iOS's tab platform didn't really let us do the things we wanted to do. So that was something where we took a pattern from from Android and applied it to iOS. There's there's other areas uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but where you do want to conform to to the platform. Well, standards. like 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 the back button in the action bar, for example, that's sure. typical. So you may you may align your visual design to this material design guidelines, but the interaction and some other key elements of the UI can be still be uh, platform based, like the yeah. back buttons or. You want to make sure to respect like your users' comfort, right? And and if they've spent all of their time on a specific platform. Um, there's going to be certain platform paradigms that make sense to adopt. Uh, so, so there's not like a, a definitive answer there. Uh, I, I would say try to be as consistent with, with the product across all platforms as possible uh, in, in the major structural and component elements, uh, but, but respect the, the platform paradigm. And there's some platform um, sort of interactions that are not necessarily tied to the to the model, right? You can, like, the back to the edge swipe on iOS to go back, you can support that without changing your design. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So really, thank you guys again. You. you can come grab us afterwards if you have uh, more questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.